Welcome. This uh, chapter, chapter 10, is sort of a continuation of what we learned with mitosis. Um, but instead of making an exact copy of the cells, we're now going to be making a new genetic combination for meiosis, where our cells will have half the number of normal chromosomes so that they can combine in sexual reproduction to make genetically diverse organisms. So um, with that, some of the words that we use are going to be the same words we used for mitosis, um, but we'll see that there are differences in how the chromosomes are laid out. So if mitosis is still a little shaky for you, you may wanna go back and really get that. Um, understanding before we move forward with this. If we look here, we'll see that we're going to do a very general outline of what is meiosis. We're going to look at how we get that genetic variation. We'll go through each of the stages. You can sort of think of it as mitosis happening twice in a cell, but only copying the DNA once, and we'll walk through how that works. We'll compare them to see what parts are different. We'll see how um, reproduction happens in the cycle of life, and then things that can happen that could change the number of chromosomes and structure in these cells and what results from that. So let's first look at meiosis as why is it a biological function? Why is it important? The first being that it introduces an enormous amount of diversity into a population. And there are more than 70 trillion different genetic combinations that can happen from the mating of two individuals. And so with that, that variation of genetic traits leads to evolution, leads to the survival of populations as environments change. So it's incredibly important to maintain that diversity. Males and females differ in how gametes are formed. In males, sperm production starts at puberty. In females, the process of making the eggs starts before you're even born. So female humans are born with all of the eggs that they will ever have. Um, and then there's a pause until puberty, which then those eggs are released. And then it will end um, at menopause. Meiosis is really just a special kind of cell division. We said mitosis in our last chapter deals with the division of the nucleus, and meiosis is just a special version of that. And it's only used for sexual reproduction. When we look at the cell cycle, we'll see that chromosomes are still replicated in the S phase of interphase and then they are halved. We pull them apart and half them into two new cells. Um, so our parents are diploid. We're gonna make four gametes at the end of meiosis that each only have haploid, N number of gametes. That means that haploid cells contain just one set of chromosomes, and if there was no way to reduce the chromosomes in meiosis, we would double our chromosome number in each generation, right? We'd have a 2N cell fusing with another 2N cell, making 4N. And then 4N would fuse with another cell and make 8, 16, etc. cetera. Um, it's important to know that there are some plants that do have this um, sort of structure and they can be more than diploid um, and have a full organism, we're going to focus mostly on humans and mostly on this process of a parent cell being diploid, these gamete cells being haploid. 
gametes will fuse in fertilization and they will make that diploid zygote. That zygote is just the cell right after the fusion of a sperm and an egg. That zygote will then develop into the diploid embryo and fetus and baby and become that diploid generation. If something in meiosis does not go correctly, the gametes will contain the wrong number of chromosomes and that can cause genetic disorders um, or possibly cause that zygote to not develop into an embryo into a fetus and we call that in everyday speech a, a miscarriage all right so let's take a look at homologous pairs of chromosomes in mitosis we talked about sister chromatids this is going to be a little bit different and i encourage you if these words aren't working in in this and you need more pictures or a video that there are resources for you on the d2l but we'll dive into it here in diploid body cells the chromosomes occur in pairs we know that you get a set of genetic information from your mom and a set of genetic information from your dad and that combines in your cells to make your chromosomes we know that we have 23 different types or different kinds of chromosomes and that diploid cells have two chromosomes of each type. So just for example, we can broadly say, you know, one chromosome codes for your eye color. You will get one from your mom, one from your dad. So that's two chromosomes of each kind. Uh, chromosomes have the same uh, or of the same type are called homologous chromosomes or just homologous. Um, and they have the same length. Their centromeres are in the same place. One came from your dad. One comes from your mom. And when we stain them with certain dyes and look at them under a microscope, we see that they have these similar banding patterns or the dye uh shows us the same pattern on the chromosome. And here's a great example of that. So we know from mitosis, this is our condensed chromatin to make a chromosome. We will duplicate it and we're very familiar with this X shape. We know that they have these sister chromatids and they're connected at that kinetochore. For example, and, and this is oversimplifying, a chromosome just isn't one trait, but if this is for eye color, this uh, chromosome comes from your dad. Then you also have this chromosome that duplicates eye color that comes from your mom. These two chromosomes that are the same type, the same kind, but are coming from different parents in your cells are going to be your homologous pairs. So they are coding for the same kind of thing, but they may have different information, if that helps you to think of it. If you think of this paternal chromosome being like, oh, it codes for brown eyes, and this maternal one coding for blue eyes, or whatever trait makes sense in your mind to think of. Um, they're coding for eye color, so they're the same kind of thing, but they may contain different information. So they are homologous pairs, not sister chromatids. If we look up here at this karyotype, um, we can see what we mean by banding patterns. When we dye these chromosomes, we can see certain color and patterns that is what is showing us that these are homologous pairs. So again, homologous chromosomes are going to have genes controlling the same trait at the same locus or the same position. That gene is going to be in duplicates, right? One from your mom, one from your dad. There are many genes that exi exist in many different forms in a large population. And if you just think about, you know, the last trip you took to the store, looking around at all of the people that were there, you'll know 
They all are different sizes, different heights, have different hair color, different eye color, different skin tone, different shoe size. That is this several variant forms in populations. Homologous copies of a gene could encode for identical information or different information. If we think back to the picture right here, if these homologous pair is a chromosome coding for our eye color, one chromosome could say brown, one could say blue, that would be coding for different information, or they could code for the same thing. In my family, both of my parents have blue eyes. They coded for blue eyes, and I have blue eyes. The variants that exist in those genes, we give that a special name. We call them alleles. So a gene is coding for a specific trait, and that variation, that version, um, is an allele. So the coding for a blue eye um, information on your chromosome, that's a blue allele, brown allele, for example. If you think about getting your genetic information from your two parents, you could get two of the same alleles, or you could get different alleles. So if you have identical alleles for a gene on both of your chromosomes, we say that you have a homozygous trait. I am homozygous for blue eyes because both of my parents had blue eyes. You may have two different codes or two different alleles. Maybe your mom codes for brown eyes, your dad codes for blue eyes. That would be heterozygous. So heterozygous is two different alleles. Homozygous is the same allele for a trait. An example from your book is that short fingers um, can be coded on one chromosome and then long fingers are coded for on the homologous chromosome. All right, so now that we see that our chromosomes are in pairs, um, one from your mom, one from your dad, we know that we need to reduce the number of chromosomes through meiosis to go from that diploid 2n number of chromosomes to haploid half the number of chromosomes. So meiosis is a reduction division. That's a very fancy way to say we're going to take 2n number of chromosomes as the cell divides, reduce by half the number of chromosomes in those daughter cells. In order to do that, there are two nuclear divisions or two times that we will divide the nucleus. In meiosis one, chromosomes are replicated before meiosis one starts in that interphase time. Each chromosome is of course going to have two identical sister chromatids, then what happens, instead of lining up one chromosome on top of the other like mitosis, these chromosomes that code for the same information are going to pair up in the middle of the cell in a place we call the synapsis. At this point, the synapsis time, chromosomes can actually switch over, change over some of their genetic information. And we will see um, that crossing over in just a few moments. But it's important to remember that once these homologous chromosomes pair up, they can actually combine and change genetic info. Homologous pairs then align themselves near each other and are pulled apart. And then each daughter cell is going to have one duplicated chromosome from each pair. It is in meiosis one that our chromosome number is reduced from diploid to haploid. 
At that point, we'll go into meiosis two, but the DNA is not replicated again. There's only one DNA replication and then meiosis one straight into meiosis two. In meiosis two, it will look an awful lot like mitosis. Sister chromatids separate, they move to opposite poles, and the end thing that we make are four daughter cells, each having one chromosome from each pair, and each daughter chromosome is just one chromatid, and these cells are haploid. So again, this is all in word form. We're going to look at it through picture form as well in the stages. Um, but if this is a point to stop and maybe watch one of the extra resource videos, that may be the best plan if these words aren't really working quite yet. All right, so let's take a look here. We've got our cell. We've got our nucleus. We've got our homologous chromosomes. Um, we can see the blue from our dad, red from our mom. And we can see that in this cell that there is four total chromosomes, a short red one, a long red one, a long blue one, a short blue one. We can see that there's a centrioles. That's again important for organizing these chromosomes as we go through our meiosis. Right, so here is our starting point for our cell. This is like right after our interphase time. All right. So now we'll see that through the process of meiosis, we are, step one, duplicating those chromosomes. So we've got this replication happening. So we've replicated our chromosomes, right? So we can see here two sister chromatids for the short red, two sister chromatids for the short blue, two sister chromatids for the long blue, two sister chromatids for the long red. Now within mitosis, our last chapter, we know that these would all line up here in the middle of our cell for metaphase um, in one long line. But as you see here, they're lining up in these pairs. These are our homologous chromosome pairs. This is that short red one from your mom, short blue one from your dad. They line up next to one another. Same thing here. Uh, the long blue and long red line up next to each other. We can still see within this cell that there is going to be four total chromosomes. One, two, three, four. This little area here between these is that synapsis. And in that synapsis, that little gap, that little space where they're next to each other, this is a time where something called crossing over can occur, um, where some of the genetic material from this chromosome will actually flip-flop places with this chromosome. And we'll see again in just a few minutes a little more about that. What then happens is, of course, we know that these are going to pull apart, pull apart. When they pull apart, we see now that only one of these short chromosomes is in this cell. One long chromosome is in this cell. So now we've reduced the total number of chromosomes, right? We went from four, one, two, three, four, to only two. We're not going to make another copy of the DNA. We will just split our sister chromatid into our two new cells. So we started here with a cell that was 4N, four chromosomes. Or I'm sorry, 2N was four chromosomes. Diploid was two. Diploid was four chromosomes. And we end with cells that only have two chromosomes. We've reduced 
the chromosome number by half. All right, so with that, what you're seeing, or what I hope you see from just that very brief overview, there are many more stages, we're gonna name them, um, but you're seeing that there's a potential for genetic variation. And we know genetic variation is very important for species to evolve and adapt in their environments. That is, it's a necessary driving force for life. Asexually reproducing organisms, they can only get variation when there's a mutation in their DNA. Meiosis gives us two ways to really get a lot of variation. The first is this crossing over that happens between homologous chromosomes. The second thing is something called independent assortment. If we go back a slide here, we can see that this red chromosome lines up here and under it is this blue chromosome. There could be another way it lined up though, right? Red could line up with red. So we're seeing already a chance for variation. Let's start here with crossing over. It is going to involve exchanging genetic material between non-sister chromatids or between your homologous pairs instead. There's going to be that synapsis. This is going to be this area of a little space where there's these proteins that are going to be between the hom homologous pair. It's going to hold them together and it aligns the DNA. And then in that space, sometimes that DNA can change arms of the chromosomes. Then when the homologous pairs separate, they are distributed into the different daughter cells with that new combination. So here's what we've got going on. Here's our two chromosomes where our synapsis is. We've got this little lattice work holding them together. And it's at this point that parts of the chromosome can switch. And this can happen all over the chromosome the exact location where they switch um, is called the uh, chiasmata. And then what we see here is we used to have an entirely red chromosome, an entirely blue chromosome, but now we've got this genetic variant, this change. We still keep this one over here as a totally blue chromosome, uh, but now we can see here we got this gene inserted and we still have this blue uh, chromosome. We kept this red chromosome, but where we exchanged this blue and red, right? This is our new genetic combination. So we're now making four unique daughter chromosomes that will then be split up into our new cells. So this is introducing a lot of variation or the potential for variation during meiosis one when we have crossing over. Independent assortment is when those chromosomes line up at that metaphase middle area plate of the cell and it is an entirely random assortment. Um, the maternal and paternal homologous chromosomes can be oriented on either side. It's not that all of your dad's chromosomes are on one side, all of your moms are on the other. It is entirely random. And it creates these mixing of alleles into the gametes. When we look at the chromosome orientations for a cell with three homologous chromosomes only, that already allows for eight combinations of paternal and maternal chromosomes. So as we increase the number of chromosomes to 23, um, we'll see that there are millions, if not billions of population or of um, possible outcomes. And um, that makes each and every one of us genetically unique. 
So here is just showing you with three possible chromosomes the way that these homologous pairs could orient. You could have all of your dads, all of your moms. You could have two and one. But here's another way you could have two and one, or here, or here. So there's all these very different ways that we can have orientation that will lead to unique gametes. On top of that, fertilization is when you have the union of a male and female gamete, and that creates genetic variation. How does that happen? Well, chromosomes are, are given from your parents, one from your mom, one from your dad. And in humans, we see that potentially um, we have two to the 33rd power squared number of possible combinations happening. If crossing over only happened one time, Here's our genetically different zygotes. But crossing over can occur several times in each chromosome. And it, it, it's amazing the genetic variation that just those 23 chromosomes with crossing over, independent assortment, and then fertilization create. Each one of you is an incredibly unique individual based on your genetic material. So again, asexual reproduction, the only thing that you will get is a genetically identical clone. In sexual reproduction, this causes genetic recombinations. And in humans with 23 pairs of chromosomes, the combination is 2 to the 33rd um, with no crossing over. But we just saw with crossing over even more um, making billions of combinations. In places where an animal or organism doesn't live very long or it has a very stable environment, asexual reproduction is advantageous. It just makes more copies of you much more quickly. However, if there is a very dynamic environment um, and it changes a lot or it's a more long-lived organism, um, the genetic variability that you get <clears throat> from meiosis and sexual reproduction is advantageous because some offspring may have a better chance of survival having a different genetic code. For example, if the temperatures continue to rise for, because of climate change, animals that have less fur, or reduced body fat, they would be in advantage. They would survive, whereas some animals would overheat or store too much fat and, and can't survive. And the genetic code codes for that. All right, so now that we've had this very brief overview and talked about genetic variation, we should talk about the exact phases of meiosis that accomplish this. In this, you are going to see many of the same vocabulary words that you saw in mitosis. In order to designate um, if this is the first part of meiosis where we reduce our chromosome number in half, or if this is the second part of meiosis where we split our sister chromatids, we call it one or two. I like to remember in meiosis one, I am taking one cell to start and dividing it into two cells. And then in meiosis two, I take those two cells I made in meiosis one and split those into two new cells. So if that helps you to think meiosis one is starting with one cell, use that information. If that does not help you, throw it away and forget I said it. All right, so let's look at the first part of meiosis one. We call it prophase but it's prophase one. In prophase one, a spindle is going to form just like in mitosis. The nuclear envelope is going to disappear just like in mitosis. Nucleolus disappears just like in mitosis. Each chromosome is duplicated just like in mitosis. 
Here's where it's different. The homologous chromosomes pair up and align at this synapsis. We call those homologous pairs lined up next to each other a tetrad or a bivalent. Both words are used. This is meaning that we're starting to line up as a, a two X's next to each other instead of the X's that are our chromosomes on top of one another. In metaphase one, metaphase one, we are going to have those homologous pairs lined up in the middle. So in prophase one, we've duplicated and we begin our lining up and our crossing over happens. In metaphase one, we see that these pairs are lined up in the metaphase plate and they are independently assorted and attached to spindles. Then in anaphase one, homologous chromosomes are separated and pulled to opposite poles. The chromatids do not separate. So now we're moving that whole X structure to the sides of the, of the cell. So each of our duplicated chromosomes still has its sister chromatid of itself. But what we've done is reduced the numbers of chromosomes from diploid to haploid. Then we have telophase one, where the daughter cells have duplicate, or um, the daughter cells um, each have a duplicated chromosome. They have one of the homologous pairs. We go through a little stage called interkinesis. It's not cytokinesis. We, we are just sort of waiting. Um, but at this place, uh, we, we are shorter than interphase and the DNA does not replicate again. We're just in this sort of pause. So that is our first section. And I'm going to skip ahead just a little to show us the pictures and then we'll come back. Okay, do, do, do. so here is in meiosis one, we have our cell. In prophase one, we start to lose our nucleus, we duplicate our chromosomes, and we have crossing over. In metaphase one, we're lining up our homologous pairs on that middle plate, M for metaphase one, M for middle. Then in anaphase one, we're pulling these homologous chromosomes to opposite sides of the cell. So now we have our reduced number of chromosomes. We went from four total to two total. We have our telophase where we sort of pinch in and then we're waiting in interkinesis. All right, um, so a really fun story that pops up in your book is about parthenogenesis, that parthenogenesis, which is found really in reptiles and some fish, um, where it's a form of reproduction where only one parent gives the genetic information. It's usually female lizards. Uh, there's no males present where they are, and so they are giving rise to um, new baby lizards without fertilization. Um, so one example from your book is a whiptail lizard that uses a special process in meiosis where crossing over happens between the sister chromatids instead of non-sister chromatids and basically then sexual reproduction is happening. We're rearranging genetics. Um, 
And what happens though is that the species doubles their chromosomes prior to meiosis, then they'll make these homologous in a single cell. And because of these differences, there is a tiny bit of genetic variation passed on to the next generation. That being said, this is not a like a sustainable way that they always reproduce. It's usually in times where they can't find a male to reproduce that they will do this. Um, that being said, there have been lizards and snakes in captivity that have laid eggs and given birth um, without the presence of a male. And it's because of this parthenogenesis. Okay. With that fun little story, let's then transition back into the phases of meiosis. Now we're going to be in meiosis two. And really, this is just mitosis in these two haploid cells. That's what I like to remember two is about. So we have prophase two, where the chromosomes recondense if they loosened up. We have metaphase two, where we now line up the chromosomes at the metaphase plates. They're not in any pairs anymore. They're one on top of the other, just like in mitosis. We have anaphase two, where we are going to see that the sister chromatids are pulled apart. And then telophase and cytokinesis give us four haploid cells that are genetically unique, and they are a mixture of the mom and dad genetics. So again, meiosis one, we just saw with four chromosomes, are homologous pairs being separated into two cells, and then there's waiting, interkinesis. In meiosis two, we take these two cells, and now we separate these sister chromatids and make our four genetically diverse daughter cells. So we will have prophase one, where we're, or I'm sorry, prophase two, where we will lose our nucleus, organize our spindles. Metaphase two, where our chromosomes line up in the middle of the cell, but it's happening twice, remember that. Uh, then anaphase two, where we're pulling the chromosomes away and telophase two, cytokinesis, um, where we are going to make four genetically diverse haploid daughter cells. And again, there are videos on the D2L for you. If this picture form isn't doing it for you, watch those videos. It'll walk you through these steps as well. Um, but definitely keeping the differences between metaphase one and what's happening here in metaphase two, anaphase one and anaphase two. Um, and I suggest even trying to draw it out on your own is, is a helpful exercise. And uh, this is our close up of just meiosis one. Here's our close up of just meiosis two. So again, if we compare them, meiosis to mitosis. In meiosis, we have two divisions. We have that meiosis one division and meiosis two. Uh, or, yeah, meiosis two. Mitosis is just one division. In meiosis, chromosomes have a synapse where we have crossing over, creating genetic diversity. In mitosis, that does not happen. In meiosis, we have our centromeres that are going to continue on after meiosis one. In mitosis, uh, we will see that those spindle fibers and everything disappear after anaphase. In meiosis, we have half the number of chromosomes that we start with when we end. Mitosis, we have genetically identical. We keep the same chromosome number. In meiosis, we have four daughter cells. Mitosis is two. Meiosis is that they are genetically unique. 
mitosis is that they are genetically identical. Meiosis is only used for sexual reproduction. Mitosis is for asexual reproduction, growth, and repair. What does make them the same sort of process, though, is that they are these orderly series of stages where the chromosomes are sorted and divided. We have, of course, the prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. All of that is going to occur. Spindle fibers are going to be the things pulling apart our chromosomes and organizing them. And cytokinesis is going to be the end process that gives us cytoplasm in each cell. So if we look at meiosis compared to mitosis, if we start with meiosis 1, when we have prophase 1, we have homologous chromosomes pairing. In mitosis, there's no pairing here. In metaphase, there's these four um, homologs or those um, homologous chromosomes lined up next to each other at the metaphase plate. In metaphase, it's just one chromosome on top of the other. Uh, in anaphase, the um, bivalents are separated. Sister chromatids are separated in anaphase. In telophase one, you have two haploid daughter cells that are unique. And in telophase of mitosis, two diploid daughter cells that are identical to the parent. If we then compare meiosis 2 to mitosis, we will see that these are very similar. Um, we don't have any pairing in prophase 2. We have no pairing in prophase. In metaphase 2, our haploid number of du duplicate chromosomes are what are on the metaphase plate. They're lined up on top of each other. It's the haploid number. In mitosis, it's diploid. In anaphase 2, the sister chromatids separate, same for anaphase. In telophase 2, we're making two new haploid daughter cells that are not genetically identical. But if we remember, meiosis 2 means there's two cells doing this, so we end up with four. In mitosis, we have our two genetically identical daughter cells. So we can see here meiosis 1. In comparison, and then here's our meiosis 2 section in comparison. So again, there are parts of this that are similar, um, but meiosis 1 is going to be with our homologous pairs lined up compared to our chromosomes in mitosis. Um, but if we went down here in meiosis 2 to metaphase 2, that would look similar, but it's happening in two cells at a time. So again, I encourage you um, to look at these pictures, watch through the videos on the D2L um, in order to see the similarities and differences sort of play out in real time. Um, and of course, please ask questions if you have any as you're going through these things. All right, let's take a look at a life cycle, generalized, and then go into more of what we see for humans. So a life cycle is just all of the reproductive events that occur from one generation to the next generation of the same similar organism. So we look at like life cycles of an oak tree, life cycles of a human, life cycles of a flower, um, life cycles of a dog. Each organism has a life cycle. In plants, there is this haploid thing that grows that then also has a diploid thing that grows. So when you look at like a flower, you're looking at a diploid organism, but within that diploid organism, you'll have a haploid 
multi-celled structure. The haploid individual is called a gametophyte. It may be larger or smaller uh, than the diploid individual. It just really depends on the plant that, that this is coming from. I like to say gametophytes make gametes. Um, this little uh, ending suffix here, phyte, means plants. So plant that makes gametes. So it is haploid because gametes are haploid. There can be a diploid individual. Diploid is the sporophyte. Again, it could be larger or smaller than the haploid individual. It just depends on the plant. Um, sporophytes are plants that make spores, um, which is a little more complicated than the gametophyte makes gametes. Um, but just remembering gametophytes are haploid, sporophytes are diploid is more than enough for what we are going to be doing. Looking at some plants, mosses, for example, are haploid for most of their life cycle. So when you look at a moss and you look at that green leafy stuff of a moss, you are looking at a haploid gametophyte. In fungus and algae, the zygote is the only thing that is diploid. It's a a sporophyte that is diploid, um, but then the rest of its life cycle is going to be this haploid structure. Uh, ferns and other plants are diploid, and then um, obviously animals that we look at are diploid. In plants, algae and fungus, the gametes are made by the gametophyte. Okay, so that is one strategy of a life cycle is to have this alternation of generations where sometimes you are haploid, sometimes you are diploid. For animals, individuals are diploid and they make haploid gametes. The only haploid part is the gametes. It's not going to grow another structure like a fern um, or a fungus. The products of meiosis are always going to be the gametes. Meiosis is only happening in a part called gametogenesis. That's making gametes. That's the only time in an animal we see meiosis. With that, there is the production of sperm, which is called spermatogenesis, where all four cells become the sperm. Then there's the production of eggs called oogenesis, where one of those cells that we have made in meiosis becomes the egg, um, and the rest are called polar bodies, and they dissolve away. In a, humans, sperm and eggs are made by meiosis um, in the process of spermatogenesis or oogenesis sperm and egg fuse in fertilization. You have a zygote that results from that. This is that one cell stage. It's very brief. Immediately after that fertilization, you have that zygote. It goes through mitosis and it results in this multi-celled embryo, which is going to have features that were determined during that zygote stage, that fertilization gave it its genetic code. All growth in that developing embryo is because of mitosis. And as a result, um, each somatic cell in the body has the same number of chromosomes as that zygote and has the genetic makeup that happened at that moment of fertilization. For spermatogenesis, that's happening in the testes. There are these stem cells called spermatogonia. Spermatogonia go through divisions to make primary spermatocytes that then go through spermatogenesis. Primary spermatocytes do meiosis one, 
They form secondary spermatocytes that go through meiosis II that make spermatids that then turn into sperm. So the process is your spermatogonia undergoing a division to make primary spermatocytes that then undergo meiosis to make secondary spermatocytes that undergo meiosis II to make spermatids that will then mature into sperm. For every one of those spermatocytes, primary spermatocytes, that start here in spermatogenesis, we make four sperm. In oogenesis, ovaries contain stem cells called oogonia. That oogonia um, will copy itself and make primary oocytes. Primary oocytes begin oogenesis, but only a few continue at sexual maturity. So a female human is born with all of these oogonia and that she's ever going to have in her lifetime. And then there's this pause after birth until puberty where she is not making eggs. Um, so meiosis one will happen um, in the primary oocytes to form a secondary oocyte in a polar body. That secondary oocyte begins meiosis two, but stops, pauses at metaphase two. Will leave the ovary and enter the uterine tube. If there's no sperm present, the secondary oocyte will just degenerate. It'll go away. Um, if there is sperm, it will then trigger secondary oocyte to go through meiosis two, form another polar body. Fertilization will occur, and then that um, zygote will implant on the uterine wall. So we've got our male and female. Males are doing our spermatogenesis in their testes to create sperm. Females are going through oogenesis in their ovaries to make eggs. Fertilization will occur to make our zygote, which will implant into the uterus. It will develop into a embryo, then a fetus, then birth a baby, and then that baby will grow up to be an adult, and this process will happen again. How does this spermatogenesis and oogenesis happen? We have, for males in their testes, um, this primary spermatocyte that is going to um, go through meiosis one to make our secondary spermatocytes that will go through meiosis two that will make something called spermatids that will then mature into sperm. This is happening in males once they reach puberty for the rest of their lives. For females in the ovary, you have the primary oocyte. It is going to go through meiosis one to create this secondary oocyte. We will have a polar body and this larger secondary oocyte. This will then have a pause. Meiosis II um, will be completed after fertilization. So we're going to pretend that we started meiosis II and there was a sperm present. Then meiosis II will be completed. We'll get this second polar body. We have that sperm nuclei that will then fuse with the egg nuclei, and that makes our zygote that is again diploid. There can be things that will happen that can change the chromosome number and structure, right? We have this very orderly sequence and steps that happen, but um, with that, there can be changes and errors. Um, it almost always proceeds as normally, just like with mitosis, we said there's checkpoints, um, same thing, but sometimes we can have um, euploidy, that's the correct number of chromosomes, but aneuploidy is a change. So sometimes there is this aneuploidy that can happen. 
We can find this by looking at a karyotype. A karyotype just displays the chromosomes arranged by size and shape and banding pattern so that scientists can analyze it and look for changes. Aneuploidy is because of something called non-disjunction or this failure of the chromosomes to separate properly. And this can happen at meiosis one or meiosis two. You can sort of imagine those little X's of chromosomes lining up. And if they do not pull apart correctly, some of those cells that are created will gain chromosomes and some will not have enough. So we say that monosomy is you only have one of a particular chromosome and trisomy is when you have three of a particular kind of chromosome. So here's an example of this non-disjunction. We have a normal setup here with our chromosomes that are going to be split into two daughter cells. If this homologous chromosome pair does not separate properly, one of these cells will have too many chromosomes and one of these cells will not have enough. If that then continues on to meiosis two, we'll see that there are too many chromosomes and not enough. If the non-disjunction happens during meiosis two, we will see a normal cell, a normal cell, um, half of the time, because we had this normal homologous pair separation. But then we'll see for this other cell, too many chromosomes, not enough chromosomes. If we then see fertilization happening, we can see here that now we have a trisomy, one, two, three, or we have this monosomy, only one chromosome. If we look at a non-disjunction that happened in meiosis two, we see that this has two chromosomes. That's the, the um, euploidy, the normal number. Here's a trisomy and here's a monosomy. So this is a 2n plus one. So diploid plus a chromosome, diploid plus a chromosome. This is that diploid minus a chromosome. And same over here. You have two diploid normal euploides and then you have a trisomy and a monosomy. That trisomy occurs when the individual has three of a particular chromosome. Uh, in humans, three autosomal trisomy, trisomies are viable. So there's three genetic disorders that can happen where you have a trisomy, but that human is still able to be born and live and it is viable. Um, the most common is trisomy 21. It's also called Down syndrome. And the chance of a woman having a child with Down syndrome increases with her age. So when we looked very briefly at that um, ooh, genesis, we said that meiosis one will happen, then there'll be a pause, and then we go into meiosis two. Um, and so as a woman is aging um, and that meiosis two has been paused, um, then there is a greater chance that it's hard to pull apart those chromosomes and then that non-disjunction is more likely to occur. Um, and so there are many doctors that advise or, or counsel women on um, having children in their later 30s and 40s about the risks of um, Down syndrome because of this. Um, some of the characteristics are um, short stature, a flattened face, this eyelid fold, stubby fingers, and wide gap between first and second toes. Um, but as we said, having Down syndrome, even though it's an autosomal trisomy, 
this person is still able to live beyond birth and can live very long lives um, and, and do many of the quote unquote normal human things. Um, here's what it looks like on a karyotype where we can look at the chromosomes and here at chromosome 21, we see that there are three copies of that chromosome. Um, we can also see changes in sex chromosome number. You can inherit too many or too few X or Y chromosomes. Um, extra copies of chromosomes as a whole, right, like trisomies, uh, are, are more easily tolerated than not enough uh, chromosomes. So a monosomy um, in autosomes, not sex chromosomes, uh, is, is not going to survive um, normally. That's not viable. Um, but with sex chromosomes, it is still pretty easily tolerated. Um, this odd number of chromosomes in your sex cells come or sex chromosomes comes from non-disjunction during eugenesis or spermatogenesis. The first syndrome is called Turner syndrome where you just receive one X chromosome. Um, having that X chromosome makes you um, female unless you have a Y chromosome. So Turner syndrome is affecting females that just have one X chromosome. Usually they are short, broad chested, widely spaced nipples, can be of normal intelligence, and can function with hormone therapy. Then there's Klinefelter syndrome where you have XXY. The presence of that Y chromosome um, makes you male. Male um, with males with Klinefelters are going to have underdeveloped testes and prostates. They can develop breasts. They have long arms and legs. They have large hands. Uh, they can be of near normal intelligence, but the more X's that you add here, um, it is going to um, cause mental delays and deficiencies. Um, so you can have XXXY, XXXXY, um, and no matter how many X chromosomes are present, no matter what for human, um, that Y chromosome is going to um, render that individual male, biologically speaking. Um, you can also have a deletion of some genes that result in an XY female. Um, these SRY genes um, mean that you don't have testes determining factor which is what plays a role in male genitalia development. And so there can be this mutation where we delete those genes. Um, and then therefore you have a individual who looks and biologically functions female, even though they have a XY uh, chromosomes. Here is an example of Turner syndrome where you have this X chromosome, but you're missing the other chromosome. Um, or XXY, you have two X and a Y, so you've added an extra X chromosome. Environmental things like radiation, chemicals, viruses can cause changes to chromosomes. And if these broken ends of the chromosomes don't rejoin, you can have mutations. Some examples are deletion. One or both ends of a chromosome break off and it leads to the loss of a segment. You can have duplication where there is a presence of chromosome segments more than once. And you can have translocation where a segment from one chromosome moves to a non-homologous chromosome. So it's put into a new chromosome somewhere else. Um, and that's usually when there's a breakage of this homologous chromosome and they don't assemble properly. 
You can also have something called inversion where you've broken part of the chromosome off and then it is flipped and reversed before it is inserted back onto the like arm of the chromosome. So the genes are in reverse order and they're inverted. And you might be thinking, well, none of that sounds too terrible, except remembering we have that crossing over. And so we may end up um, with incorrect pairing um, during that crossover from these um, situations. Um, with humans, that change can again be detected in a karyotype or by studying inheritance. Some examples of syndromes that happen when we delete part of chromosomes. Uh, Williams syndrome is the loss of chromosome sevens part of it. Um, and that is where you have the coding for elastin, which is a protein that we find all over our body, but really like in our skin um, to help it maintain its shape and go back to its structure after it's been stretched. So we see children with turned up noses, wide mouths, small chins, big ears. Um, an example of a translocation syndrome is Allagir syndrome, which is where chromosome 2 and 20 have a translocation and it can lead to a heart defect um, that could lead to death. Um, also something called chronic myeloid leukemia. It's a blood cancer and it happens when there's a translocation between chromosome 22 and chromosome 9. So here's deletion where we lose a piece, duplication where we have an extra copy of it, an inversion where we flip where it's located, and translocation is where we've added this on, this little section to a new part of a chromosome. So you can see here it was EFGH, EF. Now it's QR, so we've taken it and inserted it onto a different part of the chromosome. Um, so again, here's our deletion um, where we get our Williams, yep, Williams syndrome, um, where we have these big ears, wide mouth, um, you, you lose that elastin. Um, and again, our translocation, um, and we can see translocation. One example was our chronic myeloid leukemia, and that is our blood cancer um, and what it looks like under the microscope. All right. Of course, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great